Hello, I'm Angela Broyles, and I'm here today with Mrs. Corinda Marsh. We are going to be discussing the father anthology, um, Gritty South produced. It's a Gritty South is a brand under uh, an imprint brand under Blue Water Publications, and Miss um, Marsh has a wonderful story in the publication, and I'm going to let her introduce herself today. I am Corinda Marsh. I am um, an ancient Southern writer. I grew up in North Florida, lived here all <clears> my <throat> life, and um, my family actually lived here before Florida was a state, probably, so I have a lot of pioneer roots, and so a lot of my characters come from people I've seen, and if you're from the South, you'll probably uh, notice some of them, um, as in the one in the buzzards in the cedar tree. Um, most of you, if you live in the South, you've driven down a, a dirt road, clay road, country lane, and you see this old shack out there, you see this cabin, and, and to me, they're beautiful, but um, log cabin, <clears throat> and uh, and there seems like in the South, there's almost always a recliner on the front porch. And there's somebody sitting in that recliner and they're looking off into the distance, you know, and you, and sometimes they'll wave to you. Sometimes they look like they don't even see you. And the dust is, you know, going up behind you and all that. And um, my family, my father grew up in, in a log cabin on a dirt road that's still there. And in fact, part of the cabin is still there. And um, they cut the logs off the property and built that in the early 1900s. And I've been down that road so many times and I've seen that that very scenario. And I'm very, very curious. So I always wonder, hmm, what are they thinking? I, I wonder I wonder what they do. And, and I always ask myself 10,000 questions. So I was thinking about that character when I started Buzzards in the Cedar Tree. And so I have this girl looking across the road and there's a cemetery across the road. Of course, you know, if you're from the South, you know about Southern cemeteries. And um, there's usually a cedar tree in it. And my mother always said, well, don't ever plant a cedar tree in your yard because if you do, when it gets big enough to shade your grave, you're gonna die. So Junebug's parents, and her aunt are across the road in that cemetery. And she's thinking, hmm, one of these days, mama said, one of these days, somebody's gonna come down that road and it's gonna be, it's gonna be real interesting to me. It's gonna be a surprise. So that's kind of where I went. And I I I sort of rambled around for a while and I thought about that scene and I wondered what it was Junebug was going to get surprised by. So that's how the story began. And um, it it wound up uh, finding her sister. Um, that's who came down the road. And, and her sister is another one of those. Uh, well, I'm old. So, you know, I, I know about uh, the 60s and how the women wore their hair, put the scarf on, rode the convertible. She has a convertible Cadillac and, you know, so it's the majority of my stories are character based. Um, I have a friend who writes the most wonderful plots in the world, um, but and every writer needs to know their strength. So mine is characters. So mine is all stretched around this crazy woman and um, and her sister. So that's how the story came to be. And it's just a fun story. <laughs> so how important do you think the narrator is in the story? I think it's critical. And do we have um, a, could you hear me? Yes. How important is the narrator? Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Well, that's always one of the big decisions I have to make when I start with a story. And um, the Jolene in the Buzzards in the Cedar Tree, um, 
she couldn't narrate the story. It couldn't be a first person narrator. Um, it just wouldn't, you wouldn't have gotten the humor of Jolene and you wouldn't have understood the surprises. So that one had to be omniscient. But when I think about the narrators, I always go back to, uh, most of you have either read or seen The Great Gatsby. And The Great Gatsby, um, that character, uh, the next door neighbor narrated it. Instead of if Jay Gatsby himself had told his story, you wouldn't have really been able to believe him. He would have been unreliable. So when his neighbor told the story as he saw it, he moved in for the summer and watched this and was part of the action. He was a more reliable narrator. And I'm sure there are times when an unreliable narrator is okay. But I think that one, by, when Nick Carraway told you about Gatsby, you thought you were hearing the truth. So that um, that's always a major decision that I have to make when I start writing. Um, the first memoir I wrote was my father's stories. Uh, after he died, I decided to write all of his stories. And um, the hardest thing was deciding on the narrator. Who was going to tell it? And I finally told it as if I were telling, I were the narrator and telling it to my grandchildren. Um, I'm revising it a little bit now and I may do it a little bit differently, but um, I think that's critical to any, any book that you write. Think about that first. And you might want to take more than one stab at it. Uh, try it from different narrative points of view because it makes a difference. So was The Great Gatsby a good book? Was it a good book? Is that what Is it, was, was it your favorite book? Oh, no, not really. I don't think F. Scott Fitzgerald was that great of a writer. I, I disagree. I know it's on all the canon. But um, a, another book, that has multiple narrators is one of my favorites. And that's Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. And okay. probably a lot of the a lot of you listening have not read As I Lay Dying. And I went through a period of time when I was teaching American Lit and I said, oh, that book is, I, I just can't inflict that on my students. It's painful. And then I read it again. And Faulkner uses, I can't remember the number, but it's something like seven or eight different narrators. Each character, the, the mother dies and they carry her back to where she came from to bury her. And it's hilarious if you read it from the right frame of mind. So that's actually one of my favorite books. Um, not my most favorite, but <laughs> close. What, what book? Do, what book do you recommend for a beginning writer? Uh, well, it depends on what you want to write. Um, if you, um, <clears throat> if you want to write nonfiction, um, uh, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, and that is painful to read. But if you want to write nonfiction and uh, you want to tell a story that is really poignant. Um, in fact, I, actually, I think every American ought to read the Gulag Archipelago because it tells you what happened during Stalin's time. So if you want to write that kind of fiction, that's good. Um, the Old Man and the Sea is one that I often um, assign to my students because it's a very short book, but it's very, very poignant. And although I love Hemingway's style of writing, his, I, I, I have gravitated to, from Thomas Wolfe's long, elaborate sentences to Hemingway's short, choppy sentences. Um, but I think the emotion in, and the descriptions in The Old Man and the Sea are probably, for a beginning writer, if you read that carefully, you will learn an awful lot about how to describe how you want to always put the reader 
in the story. And Hemingway does that, especially in The Old Man and the Sea. Um, I carried, when I was a student, I carried Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, but I would not recommend that to any beginning <laughs> writer. It's, um, it's philosophy. And it, but what I liked about it was all the little aphorisms that would sustain me when I was in a very, very difficult time in my life. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, um, that's good. Uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved is superb. She came and talked to us when we, when I was a student at UCF. She was the most amazing. She came into the room with this big cape on and it was like a flourish. She, she swept into the room and overpowered all of us. She's, she's a fantastic writer. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, Their Eyes Are Watching God. That's another one that's fairly short. It's uh, relatively simple. It's set in Florida. Of course, I'm a Florida girl. So, it, and it, uh, I was fortunate enough that one of my professors was a, um, a Hurston scholar down at UCF and uh, Eatonville where she grew up is just outside Orlando. So that's one that um, <clears throat> is relatively simple to get through, but it's not simple at all. And if you like Southern folklore, uh, she, she got herself into a lot of trouble by writing that book, uh, just like Thomas Wolfe did with You Can't Go Home Again. And my dissertation is on Thomas Wolfe's Web and the Rock, which I think is a fantastic book. But it's probably not for a beginning writer because the sentences, you'll get lost. They're so elaborate and they're so beautiful. But Hurston, Hurston is more direct and she describes things so well um, in her story um, that the uh, the people of Eatonville, it, it is autobiographical, and the people of Eatonville uh, could identify themselves when they read it, and they were very, very angry with her because she made them, made people laugh at them. But, you know, we we should all be able to laugh at ourselves. You know, there are things we all do that are funny. And she was an anthropologist, and she looked at people carefully. So um, after she was very successful with her story, um, the, the she went back to Eatonville. She liked to go back and visit her home. And she was a part of the Harlem Renaissance movement, and she had money um, at that point. So she would go back, and she would buy watermelons and take them to the children and gather children around her and tell them stories. And um, they saw that, um, they they didn't like, the children loved her. So the grownups who'd been written up in the story like that. So they, some of them accused her later of molesting the children, one of the children. And um, she was actually, it got in a lot of trouble because they, uh, they had her arrested and it came out in the New York Times because she was big news at the time. Well, when they investigated, they found out that she wasn't even in the country at the time they said she molested these children. She was an anthropologist and she was off on one of the islands doing her work. Um, she went to Howard College and she was highly educated. So the New York Times <laughs> printed a tiny little retraction on the back page that Hurston was adjudicated not guilty because of that. And but she never sold books anymore. And she died a pauper uh, working as a maid for a lady in, I believe it was Fort Myers. And Alice Walker, color purple, uh, had her body exhumed and brought back and buried with honor at Eatonville. So yeah, that's one of my favorite books because I know a lot about her and I, it's Southern. So I like that. <clears throat> well. That's an interesting story. I never heard that. So, um, how did you find your voice as a writer? How did you How did you personally find your voice? Well, I know that's sometimes hard to land. It is, okay. and when I first started writing, <clears throat> I have a mentor that 
I connected with because of my love for Thomas Wolfe. He also is a Wolf scholar. So um, we met through that and he forced me to start writing. He, um, he told me, he said, I want you to write a book about civil war. And I want you to put yourself in the character of someone completely different from yourself. So if you ever read a civil war or behind the two below tree, as it became later when I merged it with another book, uh, I'm big Earl. I am a six foot, six inch tall black man slave. He weighs 300 pounds. He's strong. He's tough. That's me. So I wrote the book from thinking of myself as Earl. But that book, in the beginning anyway, was still written by an English teacher. And so my friend Oli one day said, Corinda, you have to get rid of the critic sitting on your shoulder. Don't pay any attention. Just write. And so it probably took me 10 years after that to do it. And I think I think it was because I finally wrote enough books, and I've written 21 at this point, published 21, I'm working on two more now. But about, I don't know, two or three years ago, I finally thought, okay, um, you're a good writer. Why don't you just talk in your voice, which is what I do now. And I finally, I think it was a matter of, gaining confidence in what I was doing. So now when I write a book, I tell it as it came out of my mouth and I, I'm, I've retired. I'm no longer teaching. Um, but even the last couple of years that I taught, I taught it in my own voice because I didn't care anymore what anybody said. And you have to reach a point where you have enough confidence that you can speak what you're thinking. And that takes a lot of effort. But when you learn to speak in your own voice, you'll write better stories. Buzzard in, in the Cedar Tree <laughs> is my voice. <laughs> and Junebug, the, the next one that'll come out, that's my voice. And that's, uh, it's um, those, a lot of the characters I really enjoy now are characters I've known. Um, and they're the people I've known are not terribly sophisticated. I um, I covered a conference once um, when I was working for a, a regional education lab. I covered a conference at, um, in, at a university in Mississippi, and I was sitting next to, seated next at dinner to the, um, uh, what was his name? William Bennett, I think, the um, national <laughs> education guy, you know, and somebody said, Brenda, do you know who you were sitting next to? I said, no, he was Rob Mines. Um, you know, I'm not impressed with anybody's title. I look at people as they are, and they can look at me like that. So now I'm comfortable with my voice. And that's why I told Angela I can talk endlessly. So uh, because I'm okay with it now. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and so what was, what was the, I mean... Obviously, you are a prolific writer and you enjoy writing. So how did you actually get started writing? How did you realize that you were a writer? Uh, a newspaper writer, when, when my book, um, Holocaust in the Homeland, was under, well, the process of becoming a movie, although it didn't make it all the way, um, a newspaper writer asked me, when did you realize you were a writer. I said, when I got my movie contract, he said, no, no. I mean, when, when did you really know you were a writer? I said, that's when I knew because I didn't really, I didn't think of myself as a writer. I was just somebody who was writing. But when I realized only my friend, Olafur Gunnarsson lives in Iceland and he's the, <clears throat> excuse me. He's the, um, Wolf Scholar, and he read my dissertation, which he didn't really like that much because I kind of gave Allie Bernstein credit for some of Thomas Wolf's work. So, but anyway, Oli and I became good 
friends and I read a lot of his work and he uh, he won the Icelandic Prize for Literature, which I guess is not as big a deal as it sounds like because there are only 100 or 300,000 people living in Iceland. But um, he uh, read my dissertation and I was writing some little things that I, I wrote my father's memoirs and some things like that. And he kept saying, you have to write. And he badgered me until I finally, he, he, he told me to write the Civil War thing. And he pushed me. It took me three years to write that. I had to do a lot of research, but I kept stumbling and falling. And every time I did, Oli would push me. And he would say, no, you, you will not quit. And uh, he and I have been friends since mm, it's 1997, I think. We've never met in person, but we've stayed good friends all these years. And over time... <clears throat> he has given me ideas for different books and I've responded to his and I, uh, I read, he writes a lot of short stories now and the ones that come out in English, I read for him, but um, he, and, and I, like a lot of writers, I've gone through periods where I would just not have it. I just wouldn't write for several years at a time. And every time I do that, he kicks me in the backside and says, okay, now you got to, you got to get with it. And so he is the reason I write. He, he just, um, he's always believed in me. And I think he finally made me believe in myself. So that's, he's, if, if, if it were not for him and, and for create space, really, um, I got over a hundred rejection letters when I wrote my first book and I submitted it. I got rejection letters from agents. I got rejection letters from publishers. It's hard to break into that. And um, I kept giving up and only kept saying, nope, nope, I refuse. You're not doing that. So then I published um, a civil war on, um, which was the beginning part of Tupelo Tree. Um, on create space and it sold real well and then when I um, I actually that's what led to uh, writing Holocaust in the Homeland I I wrote Civil War and it's not the Civil War it's a Civil War it's about the Civil Wars that we all conduct with each other but it is set in the Civil War it starts in I think it's 1818 when Alabama became a state it starts in Mobile and it, car it, it begins with a birth of a white child on a plantation and a 10 year old slave girl is assigned to take care of her. Uh, and they are together all through the years and they, um, they wind up living like sisters at the end of their lives. And um, I, um, I kept, going through that book and and writing and when I finished it and published it and people started reading it I got a lot of criticism and one friend in particular um, on Facebook said just as race relations were getting better you made them worse and my intent with that book was to make them better. And and that really disturbed me. I had a lot of people who had the opposite reaction and said, now I see how women of color, it, the color doesn't matter. And I thought I had done something good and she said I'd done something bad. So we used to go to a Charlie's for breakfast or brunch every Sunday morning and my daughter, gets embarrassed because I'll walk up and talk to anybody. And there was um, a black couple sitting behind the booth behind me. And I heard the lady say she was an editor. And so I just got myself up and I said, hi, my name's Corinda. And I told her what I had just written. And um, I said, would you consider reading my book? Because I don't, I would like, I, I would like the opinion of a woman of color because my intent was to make race relations better. 
not worse. And I would like to know how you feel about it. You're an editor, so you're familiar with writing. And I would like to know how you feel about it. So she said, sure. So I got her address and I gave her a copy of it and she read it and she loved it. But <clears throat> while we were talking, her husband said, who happened to be on the board of directors at the local community college, he said, do you know anything about the Black Wall Street riots? And I said, no, I don't. And so he told me about the Greenwood riots that happened in 1921. So I was really on fire and I came home and I started um, researching that. And, and that was, that was another time when I, it, the narrator is critical to me and they took the narrator out that I had in the movie and that's why it didn't work. But anyway, um, so I was appalled when I read that and so I read the research. So um, I decided I created a narrator from New York City and he was a white narrator and he came into town and he observed this. So they, they, um, he tells the story from his perspective. And so because of, of civil war and asking for somebody's opinion, I wound up with another story that sold much better than any of the others. And, and I, I was sitting in there in, in my recliner watching TV one night and I got a text that said, are the movie rights by any chance available for Holocaust in the Homeland? I, I nearly fainted. And I immediately answered and said, certainly. He said, well, could you send me the PDF? I said, mm, give me five minutes. So I had the PDF in Hollywood in five minutes and he bought the option to it. And it went through a lot of different stars and all, but they never actually made it to the silver screen. So so uh, I've had all kinds of funny adventures. <laughs> You've had a lot of fun adventures too. I have. <laughs> and one of the most fun ones was meeting you and submitting my story to the Gritty South because I'm as gritty as it gets in the South. <laughs> well, we appreciate having your story in the Father Anthology. I, I never know how to tilt the book on here, but... But it's beautiful. Really, I see it. Yes. Well, we really appreciate it. I was going to say, if anyone is looking for the book, like searching online, it's a strange thing. But if you go online, you have to put in father. And then because Peter Lass is the first writer listed because his story is first. You have to search for his name and then the anthology pops up. And, and so, how do you spell his last name? It's last, like the last will be first. Okay. L A S T. Okay. Peter. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in in the imprint is grittysouth.com. and um, we had just we're just thrilled to have your story in here, and thank you for joining us today to share about your writing. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. And I always enjoyed our conversations. So I'm looking forward to the next anthology. Well, we are looking forward to the mother anthology coming out next spring. So, and I know you have an excellent piece that will be in it. So.